I want to move on to the IPO market because it's been fascinating to watch this year. Kathleen, this is uh, your bailiwick. You run the Renaissance Capital IPO, um, one of the most successful uh, ETFs of the year. You're up 45 percent. You're, you're approaching $100 million in market cap. That's nice to see. So not only are prices going up, but you're getting money going into the fund. Flows are, are, are positive. Uh, 45 percent versus 5 percent for the S&P is pretty good. Um, tell me why I, uh, you buy a basket of about 60 IPOs that have gone public in roughly the last two years. Why are, have the most recent IPOs done so much better than the rest of the market? What's the outperformance due to? What are investors looking at? Sure. The uh, IPO market and companies that go public tend to be new economy companies and they're doing th disruptive things. So we're kind of in the sweet spot of what the market's been looking for now. We've had many uh, digital uh, work from home kinds of companies like Zoom Video is the top holding in the ETF. And I'm on Zoom now. It is uh, just been a very strong stock. Uh, another company such as Slack does enterprise messaging. So these businesses are benefiting from this kind of environment where businesses are moving to a more automated and virtual way of working. Also, we've seen a lot of digital platforms, um, Rocket Mortgage, for example, they're self-service. Uh, so they're able to do customer acquisition at low prices because they're using technology, lemonade, renter's insurance, uh, self-service. And then finally, we are... It is a low leverage kinds of companies that we've been talking about. IPOs tend to be growth companies and growth companies are really uh, much more valuable in a low interest rate environment, basically because the present value of future growth is higher when your discount rate is so low. So um, yeah. we're in the sweet spot right now of what investors seem to be interested in. And the future looks pretty bright. Now, we've got some rather notable names talking about going public that have filed confidentially at DoorDash. Um, we have Airbnb. We have uh, Palantir. I think it's interesting, Kathleen, like seven or eight months ago, there was a lot of talk about direct listings that maybe DoorDash would do a direct listing. Maybe Airbnb would do a direct listing. Oh, we don't need to raise money. That seems to have gone away to talk about direct listing. Now they're talking about classic IPOs. But give us a quick preview about the rest of the year. What do you, what do you see happening? Sure. I think to see what the rest of the year is, is to take one look at what's happened so far this year after the market basically shut down in March. And right now, year to date, we're ahead of last year after that shutdown. And in fact, the summer months, including this August, is going to finish up with more capital raised, I think, than any August on the record books. So we're seeing an, an amazing turnaround, an amazing amount of issuance in the regular IPO market. We're also seeing SPACs come out, which are sort of getting uh, enabling companies that don't have easy to study metrics uh, uh, get to be acquired through SPACs. So some of the froth, I think, is coming out through the SPAC market. So now, that, now we have that's a very good. That, that's a great point. I want to I want to follow up on that point you're bringing up about SPACs. And, and John and Christian, feel free to jump in. But let me just follow up on on that question, Kathleen. You know, things are getting hot when we have a SPAC ETF announced. Defiance announced they've got a SPAC ETF uh, that's coming out, uh, which is obviously is going to consist of recent uh, SPACs, uh, special purpose uh, acquisition companies. Uh, and I'm wondering if you could comment on that, because that's taken me a little bit by surprise. It started gaining, gaining some steam last year, but now it's really big. What's going on with everyone trying to do a SPAC right now? Is it a way to end run the IPO market? What, uh, Kathleen, just give us 30 seconds of what the SPAC business explosion is all about. What's really the story there? Sure. The most important thing to know is our products include operating companies and SPACs are not operating companies till about two years after they then make an acquisition. But they're, they're public blind pools. And the way we see it, we've studied these once they make their acquisitions and the returns are much worse than the returns in the regular IPO market. So investors have to be pretty cautious about how when they hold them and whether they'll stay in through the acquisitions that are made at the end. But they're very popular because there are a lot of companies that don't cannot go public and, and simply uh, they don't have the kind of metrics that IPO investors want. And so they're able to go public by being bought by a SPAC. 
And so some of the froth, I think, that could have been in the IPO market, I think the IPO market still has a certain amount of discipline. If any, right now you can say the market has had discipline. And then some of the more speculative vehicles, such as uh, Virgin Galactica, companies that don't make money but are like these big ideas, are being able, are getting funded through the SPAC market. So is it fair to say that in a hot market, and we have a hot IPO market, SPACs are kind of a way to end, end run some of the public scrutiny that might uh, be brought down on them um, that are uh, not completely ready to IPO? Is that fair or am I being no, a little I, I think that explains it, it explains it very well. And I think it's really buyer beware with this vehicle. But they have to work, and our studies show they don't yet work. So perhaps uh, that will change. But we have studied the ones that have made acquisitions, and the returns have been poor yeah. on average, with the exception of some very hot names that uh, tend to then attract investors to the space. Yeah, Kristen and John, any any thoughts on on the IPO market? I mean, you have to admit, I mean, the IPO ETF, which is a basket of about sixty stocks, up almost fifty percent this year. That is really rather spectacular. Perhaps uh, they're lucky enough to be in biotech that's doing well. And of course, as Kathleen says, a lot of it ending up as uh, work from home. But it's still a pretty spectacular outperformance overall. I, I would just say that I think the IPO market this year has really captured this theme of the uh, digitization of commerce. And when you look at many of these top performers, Lemonade, Rocket, Zoom Video, Cloudfare, that's the digitization kind of movement, especially in this COVID economy. And then in addition, as you said, there's been some nice, you know, biotech healthcare that has been, you know, unique to the COVID environment. So kudos to this IPO ETF. It's really uh, delivered on its uh, promise this year. And then I, I would just yeah, say, I would Bob, agree with that. Go ahead. Go ahead, John. Sorry, Bob. I was just going to, uh, you know, I, I'm a big believer uh, as a quant investor that if you're going to take on the risk of owning an asset, you should be compensated for that risk. So if you look at the IPO uh, ETF from Kathleen's firm, you know, it has produced um, better risk adjusted returns than, let's say, the Russell 2000 index. So, I mean, Kathleen may have a difference of opinion about what's the right benchmark, but the volatility of the IPO market, you know, I, if I match that versus a small cap, uh, index, the IWM ETF, I mean, it has outperformed that index on a risk-adjusted basis. So I do think that there's a, a place for, you know, thematic secular growth stocks, IPO stocks in a portfolio. And what Kathleen said is spot on. Like, you know, in a low interest rate environment, companies that have higher growth prospects, you know, will produce more cash flows as the Fed anchors interest rates at zero percent. A couple of reasons um, for uh, the benefit of this kind of portfolio is that we put these constituents are the largest, most liquid ones. So when you worry about a, a low float, we have very uh, high tradable float, which minimizes that uh, those first day pops and things like that. The valuations become sensible more better in the larger companies that go public. Right. And also, these are companies that are not yet in big uh, indices. They're, uh, they're either not in them or they're underrepresented. Uh, when Facebook went public, for example, it took two years for Facebook to be in the S&P product. So it's a way to own. There's um, yeah. good diver some diversification that comes out of this portfolio. And Kathleen, maybe this is a good time just to clarify what's in this, because I get this question all the time. And my shorthand answer is it's roughly 60 companies that have gone public in the last two years. But can you clarify that? Do you cap the number and do you have uh, do you set a cutoff date after two years? You drop them. Just clarify what's in the in it and, and point out also there's an international IPO ETF as well, I would say. Sure. The way it works is it has to be uh, it, it can't be more than two years from its IPO. So any but any company there qualifies. But it also, if you take the market caps of all the companies that have gone public over that period, the top 80 percent get in. So we are trying to capture the essence of the IPO market without having the turnover and the stocks that are not that are small and not part of that market cap. And then uh, it will include on a fast entry basis, very big ones. So rocket companies, for example, came in between rebalances, their quarterly rebalances, so we could include the really large ones. The interesting thing about our international product, which has not been out as long as the US, is China and the fact that ch the Chinese companies are going to pretty soon 
not be able to come public here unless they follow our US regulations on accounting disclosure. And so what's happening is we're getting Chinese companies rushing to come out here ahead of this window closing, like Lufax, one of the very large peer-to-peer -peer lenders is gonna come public here. But Alibaba's Ant Financial, which is going to be the largest IPO ever, is not going to come public here. It's going to come public in Hong Kong. And so our international IPO ETF, which includes stocks outside of the US, is going to be one of the early products that can hold Ant Financial. And while it's not that well known here, it is going to be a very big name and an important name to hold in portfolios. So the international product will give exposure to that. And you can buy this in US dollars. So you have a, it's a vehicle yeah. that's efficient for a and US Kathleen, dollar investor. When will Ant Financial go in the international? Uh, w w do we have a timetable for when it might go public yet? We think when in, the next, Ant will go in the next month. In the next month. Next month. And when would it go right. into the international IPO ETF? Well, given its size, it will go in before a rebalance. So it, it, as early as after five days of trading, we're going to include that in uh, the ETF, the international ETF, because it's so Within big. five days of it going public? Yes. Is that right? Within five days, you could put it in? Yes, after day five.